Well, hello, everyone. Um, it's us again, uh, Al, David Wood, and Sam Shamoon. And we love you so much that we decided just all of a sudden to do yet another live show. And uh, this time we are going to talk for the next hour about passages from the Quran, select passages only, there is a lot of them, that confirm the Bible, what they say about the Bible, and how they confirm the authority and the authenticity of the Bible. And as my brothers here will be going through it, I periodically will also interject things from even the commentaries, the uh, basically one of the main sources that Muslims will go to, at least Muslim scholars will go to, to affirm things and to interpret what the passage is all about, and sometimes even the reason for the revelation, and so on and so forth. And with that says, I'm going to turn it over to David. So David, which one of those passages would you like to start with? Um, well, well, there are all, all kinds of passages to deal with, and, and uh, Christians really need to get their minds around the significance of uh, the passages we're going to be going through, because, um, I mean, if, if, if I could change one thing in the world of, of, of apologetics, it would be getting Christians to understand um, what the Quran says about the Bible, and the reason is, uh, historically, um, in discussions between Christians and Muslims in the West, it's, it's usually Muslims who are on the offensive. They're, they're attacking. They're attacking Christian doctrine. They're attacking, um, they're attacking the, the authority uh, of the Bible. And Christians are, on, are in a defensive position. They're trying to, defend the, uh, uh, trying to defend the text and so on, trying to defend their doctrines. Um, but there, there's, there's a problem here because if Christians simply knew what the Quran says about the Bible, they would be able to... Um, turn the attacks and criticisms of Muslims back against Islam. And what I mean here is take any objection that Muslims would use uh, to Christian doctrine. As long as you can defend it from Scripture, so as long as you can show in the Bible where Jesus died by crucifixion, as long as you can show um, in the Bible that Jesus is Lord, as long as you can show in the Bible that Jesus rose from the dead, as long as you can show these things from Scripture, you force the Muslim to claim your scriptures have been corrupted. You right. force the Muslim to say your scripture has been corrupted. That's if it's saying something that contradicts uh, the teachings of Islam. But what happens if the Quran itself says that our scriptures haven't been corrupted, or that no one can corrupt our scriptures, or that our scriptures are still reliable and authoritative? Then the Muslim has a problem, right? Because he's saying um, your Bible's been corrupted because it says this thing that I disagree with, but the Quran says, no, it hasn't been corrupted, and right. therefore, they've got a problem. And here's how I use this argument usually. I use it to, com uh, to convince Muslims that, unfortunately, at the end of the day, it's a man-made religion because mere men always want to interject their own thoughts. Even mm -hmm. their own book doesn't mm -hmm. say it, as you stated. But somehow Muslims are convinced that the Bible is corrupt. Mm -hmm. And they, 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 did not, they did not get that from the Quran. If you, as a Muslim, did not know what was in the Bible and you picked up a Quran, and you read the Quran from beginning to end, right. it would never even cross your mind that the, the Bible, corrupt. the scriptures of Jews and Christians Correct. have been corrupted. You would think that Jews and Christians are not following their scriptures, that they have corrupted their interpretation of their scriptures, that they have, uh, that they have been led astray. Correct. But you would not conclude that their scriptures are unreliable or no longer authoritative. Muslims Absolutely. did not get that from the Quran itself. They got it from actually looking at what the Bible says and realizing, recognizing that the Bible contradicts the core teachings of Islam. And so notice they say they say corrupted. They don't say, well, it's never been it's never been inspired, right? I mean, if, right. if you came up to me with uh, with, with some book, like the Da Vinci Code or something, I would say, oh, the, the, the book disagrees with, me, disagrees with me, it's been corrupted. I wouldn't say corrupted, I never believed it was inspired to begin with, so it doesn't matter whether it's corrupted or not. But Muslims say corrupted, why do they say corrupted? Well, your average Muslim does know that, that Islam affirms at least the in, initial inspiration That's right. of the Torah and the Gospel, right. and that would probably be uh, a good passage to start with. That would be chapter 3, verses 3 yeah. to 4. Which sadly, the by Quran. the way, David, they, they kind of like accuse their God of being weak. Oh, they, no, they, they, <laughs> massively weak, right? Yeah. Because a, as we're going to see, um, according to the Quran, uh, in this passage that, that, that we're, we're about to read, in fact, uh, in chapter 3, verses 3 to 4, Allah reveals the Torah and the Gospel as a guidance for mankind. Correct. But according to, to Muslims, who, whom, 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 did it, whom did our scriptures guide? They say, oh, yeah, they, gu they guided people for a while. Well, 
I mean, we know that the 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 ins, I mean the uh, the view of uh, uh, the deity of Christ and Jesus' death by crucifixion and his resurrection from the dead. We know that these beliefs go back to the first century. So it must have been corrupted very, very quickly. And so if Allah gave this as a guidance for mankind, he didn't do a very good job of correcting. So this, notice, this would be like me saying, um, hey, I want to give you a message, Al. And so I go to hand it to you, and someone comes along and just smacks it on my hand. Oh, I wanted to give it to you as a guidance, but you know, I just couldn't get the message to you. It would make me seem very weak. Um, and that's what, that's what it seems like with, and to be clear, I'm not saying that according to the Quran, Allah looks weak in his preservation of the scripture. Uh, according to the Quran, you can't corrupt Allah's scripture. He's too powerful. I'm saying according to what Muslims tell us. Muslims are the ones telling us that, yeah, right. it says right there that Allah wanted to give the, 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 the Torah and the gospel as a guidance to mankind, but he just couldn't protect it. He couldn't, he couldn't guard his message. All these people came in and overpowered him. And uh, that's, uh, that's just bad theology. But okay. uh, in the Quran here, chapter 3, verses 3 to 4, he, Allah, has revealed to you the book with truth, verifying that which is before it. And he revealed the Torah and the gospel aforetime, a guidance for the people, and he sent the Quran. It doesn't actually say Quran there in the Arabic, but uh, that, that's, that's the, the usual interpretation. So, Allah revealed the book with truth, verifying that which is before it. And he revealed the Torah and the gospel. So Allah revealed the Torah, not only the Quran, but also the Torah and the gospel. That's right. And so your average Muslim, even though he's not familiar with, with the passage itself, is familiar with at least the Islamic teaching that the Torah and the gospel were revealed scripture initially. And so they're, they're familiar with that, but they also know that the Bible doesn't line up with the Quran today. And so since it was inspired, but doesn't line up today, it must have been corrupted because the alternative the alternative is that Islam is false. If, the, if the, the Torah and the Gospel were inspired and they were preserved accurately, well, Islam would be false because Islam contradicts those books. So the only conclusion they've been able to come up with is that the Bible has been corrupted. Now, there are going to be some problems that arise, even in this very verse itself. I mean, even in these verses themselves, right? right. So even if we just go to the, 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 the main passage that we would think of when we're talking about the inspiration of the Torah and the Gospel, isn't there a problem already here that's often concealed in English translations? That's, right. that's concealed <clears throat> in English translations? Yes, that's what I was going to mention, actually. This would actually be a good passage to check the Arabic with. Yeah. yeah, because if you know, because he's the Arabic expert here, in verse 3 it says that the book that was sent down, Musaddiqan lima baina... Yeah, and now, that's the yeah. truth. Yeah. Now, how's that translated here? Uh, well, in your translation, it says, uh -huh. Reveal to the book which is verifying that which is before it. it that which is that. before it. So, yeah. so that's like temporally before it. It yeah. came, so it may have that's been corrupted. Right. It that's came right. in the past. Is that what it's actually saying nope. in the Arabic? No, it no. says, Musaddiqan lima bayna yadayh, meaning is attesting to the truth, to that which is between his hand, which is an idiom, which, to say, to, which yeah. existed right now. So break yeah. this break this down for, for viewers. Baina, what would that be? Between. Uh, between his hands. Like he has it, like he's looking at it right so, now. But baina, baina is between. Right, right? that's right. Yadehi, yep. his hands, right? His hands, exactly. So this doesn't say verifying that which is before it, as if this 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 was something, something, past, something yeah. at some time in the past. That's how many translators yeah. translate it. That's how many translators translate it, because... Notice, they're, they're deliberately giving the impression that this is leaving open the possibility that the scriptures were revealed in the past and yet they've, yeah. been, they've been corrupted. That is right. But, and right. already, just, just reading the Arabic, yeah. it's talking about something right there, right? Something that's present. And, and even, even there are Muslim scholars who have acknowledged this, right? Yeah, but not only that, but even in this translation, to translate it this way, that which came before it, how can you then test the Quran's claim that it confirms what came before it if you don't have access to mm -hmm. that which came before it? How am I going to know? If the Quran is saying it confirms that which came before it, let's go with this translation, even though it doesn't capture precisely the Arabic, which is even more powerful. The only way I can know if the Quran confirms the scriptures that came before it is if I have access to the scriptures. Otherwise, this is a vacuous claim. Mm -hmm. How do you know? How do you know the Quran does confirm? Yeah, and, and it's, really a, it's really a sad situation because the way your average Muslim would interpret that, given his already, uh, uh, the, the beliefs he already has, is he would interpret this to mean that the Quran affirms some scriptures that have now been lost. That's right. right? They, they've now been lost yeah. and corrupted. How would you know that? Yeah. So uh, notice, using this method, I could say, uh, I affirm the Quran. And when I say Quran, I mean some Quran that doesn't exist anymore. It was corrupted so that what you have now. But I'm here to affirm the Quran. It's just, it's just a Quran that, that preaches Christianity. 
How in the world would you know? Yeah. Al Qurtubi even says that uh, this is in reference to what was revealed, of course, that he has between his hands right now from the revealed books, the Torah, which means, he says, the light, okay? Yeah. So he is referring to something that in his mind, at least al Qurtubi, that existed in the time of Muhammad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, since we're talking about Musaddiq and Lima Bainadehi, that same expression is used in the same chapter, in chapter 3, verse 50, when it talks about the mission of Jesus Christ our Lord. One of the missions of Jesus, or one of the things that Jesus was sent to do, was confirm the Torah that was between his hands. So if you go to 350, <clears throat> you'll see it says, quoting the supposed words of Jesus. As Christians, we know these are not the words of Christ. But for argument's sake, Muslims believe the Quran contains the actual speeches of Jesus and other prophets. We know better, but let's go with the argument. Chapter 3, verse 50, it says, I have come to you to attest the law which was before me. Again, the expression, same things in chapter 3, verse 3. Right. مُسَدِّقًا لِمَا right. بَيْنَ يَدَيَّ Because here it's not between his hands, between my hands. So literally, the Quran has Jesus saying, I have come to confirm. The word sadaqa, as you're the Arabic expert, you can confirm. Sadaqa means to confirm, to bear witness to, right? To testify that something is true, <clears throat> giving credence to its veracity. So basically, Jesus is saying, I have come to confirm this Torah between my hands, the Torah that I have access to, the Torah that I'm able to consult and read, as true as being that revelation from God. Historically, did Jesus confirm <clears throat> a Torah other than what we, we possess today? No, it could be because we, uh, unless a Muslim wanted to interpret that as Jesus came to an, came to confirm a Torah that no longer existed and had already yeah. been corrupted, Muslims have a problem because we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, yes. which are before the time of Jesus, so we know what the Torah said yeah. during the time of Jesus. That's and so right. if that was the Torah that was uh, confirmed by and Jesus, Abu then... Bakr's own given title by Muhammad supposedly was a Siddiq. It comes from that verb. Because he basically believed in Muhammad now. He didn't believe in something before Muhammad. He believed in Muhammad. Exactly. Bore witness to yeah. supposedly him being a prophet. Yeah. Since we're in chapter 3, if you guys don't mind, there's another one I'd like to look at. This one really, really, really is a problem for the Muslims. Because Which it's verse? chapter 3, verse 81. This is another one. I actually have an article I wrote on this years ago on answeringislam.net or if you want to go to answering-islam.org, either URL will work. The server is down right now. Lord willing, it will be back, you know, working tomorrow. But here's the one that, uh, I don't know how Muslims are going to escape this one, 381. Notice what it says. Behold, God took the covenant of the Prophet, saying, Allah in Arabic, but I don't know, For I chose it in translation, says God. Right. Here's the covenant that God took from the Prophets, saying, I give you a book and wisdom, okay? Then comes to you an apostle, a messenger, confirming that which is with you, right? Do you believe in him and render him help? God said, do you agree and take this, my covenant, as binding on you? They said, we agree. He said, then bear witness, and I am with you among the witnesses. So according to this, God supposedly told the prophets, I'm going to send a messenger. This is how you're going to know this messenger is sent from me. He's going to confirm the book that's with you. Now, the word confirm is musaddiqun. Same verb. Same verb is used in the other passages. Now, which Muslim in his right mind would say that <clears throat> this messenger would come up to Jesus and say, Hey, Jesus, I confirm that part of your Injil is sound, but part of it is corrupt. Or if he had come up to Mo um, Moses saying, Moses, I confirm that part of your Torah is sound, part of it is corrupt. Would any Muslim disagree with us that this messenger would have to confirm the complete authenticity and veracity of any scripture in the possession of the prophet, right? Yeah, and, so and it, it says here, Lima aitaitakum min kitab, full yeah. book. Yeah, so yeah. he would have to confirm that whatever that prophet had, all of it in its entirety right. is the That's word right. of God. That's right. All right, now. He didn't say min ayat. Yes, he says, right? no, that book. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I confirm all, exactly. all that you have in your possession, yeah. all that's contained in it. That's exactly. God's word. That's how you know I'm that messenger to come. That's now, right. Muslims will tell you Muhammad fulfilled it, but here is where I'm confused. When Muhammad showed up, none of the prophets were around. So how was this promise fulfilled? Because this is a promise of Allah, a covenant he made. I'm going to send this messenger. So I want to know, how did this messenger confirm the books of the prophets when supposedly this is, this is supposedly Muhammad, Muhammad showed up when all the prophets were gone. How did Muhammad fulfill this? What did he do? He would have to confirm 
the same scriptures in the possession of the prophets, which would have had to have been in existence at the time of Muhammad. Otherwise, how could he have fulfilled this covenant? But do you understand the implication right. of that? That's right. That means whatever scriptures are given must have been preserved intact at the time of Muhammad. Otherwise, Muhammad could not confirm those scriptures. And if he didn't confirm those scriptures, this covenant goes unfulfilled. So what are you saying, Muslim? Well, I wish there was a Muslim where I can ask the question, but there isn't. Mm -hmm. So here's another passage that confirms that whatever scriptures were given through the prophets, God preserved them perfectly intact. And they must have been in existence at the time of Muhammad in order for this promise to have been fulfilled. Now, again, mind you, I don't believe this is a true prophecy. I believe these are just words Muhammad made up or was inspired to make up to saying, look, God had told the prophets, I'm coming, and here's how you know I'm that prophet. I confirm whatever scriptures God gave them, and the scriptures you have in your possession, I'm telling you, those are their scriptures, and I confirm they're true. And that's what we find over and over that's and right. over again in the Quran. That's right. Muhammad is sent to confirm the scriptures. Muhammad confirms what you possess. Muhammad confirms what's between your hands. However, as we both know, in confirming the scriptures that the Jews and Christians possessed at the time of Muhammad, that sounds the death knell of Islam because he does anything but confirm. Even though he bears witness to their textual authority and veracity, he contradicts their core doctrines. That's why Muslims came up with a communion explanation. The Bible must be corrupted. Right? That's right. So 381, I'd like a Muslim, well, we're, we don't have a live call-in show, but mm -hmm. I'd like a Muslim to try to respond to that assertion. Yep, so. Amen. <clears throat> what other passage uh, you want us to look at, David? Well, a ton. So, uh, so we know that um, chapter 3, verses 3 to 4, uh, confirms the inspiration, but even right there in the very passage, it's, it seems to be talking about something that is still present before us, and uh, the, the scriptures must have still been around during the time of Muhammad. And the, the, the reason this is important is um, your, 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 average, your, your, your average Muslim that you'll run into on the street will just have no idea, he'll believe that the, the Bible's been corrupted, but he'll have no idea when or where. If, if he says something, you'll get something like the Council of Nicaea. Now, as a rule, yeah. anyone, anyone you yeah, run into who yeah. starts saying Council of Nicaea with regard to the Christian scriptures and their preservation, you can immediately spot a person who has absolutely no clue what he's talking about. Exactly. Council of Nicaea had nothing to do with, uh, with the, the selection of Christian scriptures. So as soon as someone starts saying, oh, the end of the books of the Bible, they're, they were chosen at the Council of Nicaea, that person just immediately, dude, you have no clue what you, you had no clue what you're talking about. Tell me, tell me what the Council of Nicaea, uh, tell me what happened there with regard to the Christian scriptures. The person has, an, he's not going to have an answer because this is just something they, people pass around as rumors. That's right. And it never crosses anyone's mind to sit there and yeah. investigate what's claimed. So, yeah. uh, so it, it, any Muslim who's done anything remotely resembling any study knows that the Christian doctrines that Muslims claim were corrupted go back to the first century. Belief in Jesus, death by crucifixion, belief in his uh, uh, atonement for sins, belief uh, in his resurrection from the dead, belief in his deity, all of these doctrines can be traced back to the first century. So for Muslims who want to claim that the scriptures have been corrupted, they have to say they were corrupted all the way back in the first century. So our scriptures must have been corrupted in the first century because we know the doctrines go back to the first century. Why is that a problem? Well, the scriptures were still around during the time of Muhammad. That's the seventh century, right? So somehow, somewhere, there are reliable scriptures, reliable Torah, reliable gospel that are preserved in the first century, the second century, the third century, the fourth century, the fifth century, yeah. and the, the sixth century, century, all the way into the seventh century, at the very least for the Quran to even be coherent in what it's saying. And we have, lo we have lots of passages on this. Um, one important one, chapter 7, verse 157. So chapter 7, verse 157, there's a lot of stuff in the middle. We'll read uh, the, the parts that are actually relevant here. People can read the entire verse if they want to. Um, chapter 7, verse 157 says, refers to those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find mentioned in their own scriptures or written down with them in their own scriptures. In the Torah and the gospel, it is they who will prosper. So this is referring to people at the time of Muhammad who are finding Muhammad mentioned in the Torah and the gospel. This only makes sense if we still have the Torah and the gospel during the time Precisely. of Muhammad. And, and that it's uncorrupted, right? Because if you, if you say the Torah and the gospel were corrupted during the time of Muhammad, 
what relevance can there possibly be in saying our prophet is mentioned in corrupt scriptures? That's right. Well, how would I know? Well, how would I know that 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 Nobody the mentions of him, added it by yeah, are are, are not part of the corruption, right? right. Yeah, right. Uh, in other words, just think, I mean, just think about this. It makes absolutely no sense to appeal as the basis um, for your own religion to scriptures that are corrupted. It would be incoherent nonsense. You know how you really know that I'm a prophet because of those scriptures that are corrupted and you can't trust. Yeah, that would be that incoherent sense, nonsense, yeah. and yet. That's what Muslims believe is the, is one of the one of the main arguments offered by Muhammad for for his yeah. his own authority. But why 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 is seven one fifty seven? Yeah, and, and because you're using to show that the Torah and the Gospel must have existed in uncorrupt form during the time of Muhammad. I just want to solidify that point, if I can, by just quoting some more along those lines. Uh, you know, don't you love when the internet is very slow? I'm going to just mention the references until we get our internet connection. Well, there it goes, all right. Chapter two, verses 40 to 44. I'm not gonna read all of it. These are series that goes with what he just said. What was the point of 7157? You cannot say that the Torah and the Gospel were corrupted beyond restoration so that they no longer existed at the time of Muhammad because 7157 would be meaningless because it's referring to the actual genuine Torah and Gospel that contains a prophecy of Muhammad being available at the time of Muhammad. To solidify his point, because Muslims will say, well, you're nitpicking, you're just taking one or two verses. But if you look at the Quran as in its totality, it clearly proves textual corruption. The opposite is true. If you look at the Quran in its totality, there is verse after verse after verse, over a dozen verses that say the previous scriptures have been preserved, incorruptible, and they're to be used to judge whether the Quran is true. I'm just going to look at a couple to solidify his point. Chapter 2, verses 40 to 44, but I'm not going to read all of it. I'm giving it for the people who want to read all of it. But there, O children of Israel, remember my blessing wherewith I blessed you, and fulfill my covenant, and I shall fulfill your covenant, and have awe of me. Fear me. Now watch this, verse 41. And believe in that I have sent down, confirming that which is with you. There you can't play around with the Arabic or even the English. Even Yusuf Ali translates it. And believe in what I reveal, confirming the revelation which is with you. I was reading Arbery, but even Yusuf Ali gets the Arabic correct. So my question to the Muslim would be, what did the Jews of Muhammad's time had in their possession that Muhammad says, what I have been given confirms what is with you? You can't escape <clears throat> the fact that historically, textually, archaeologically, the only scriptures that Jews had at the time of Muhammad is what we read today. You can't escape it. Now, now is 41. Let me just real squ uh, quickly sk skip to 44. Will you bid others to piety? This is 244. And forget yourselves while you recite the book? What book are they reciting? It doesn't say while you recite a book that's corrupted but contains some truth. In other words, they're being chastised for not following the very book that God gave them that the Quran bears witness. This is that uncorrupt revelation preserved by God. You recite it, but you fail to follow it. Why would the Quran chide the Jews for failing to live up to a book if that's it's right. been corrupted? That's right. What kind of counsel is this? Now, if we have a few more minutes, I just want to show that You'll find, just take chapter 2. You don't need to go to any of the chapter. Chapter 2 has verse after verse hammering this point. For example, chapter 2, verse 89. Chapter 2, verse 89. When there came to them a book, meaning the Quran, confirming which was with them. Again, and they aforetimes prayed for victory over the unbelievers. Chapter 2, verse 91. Count how many verses in chapter 2. Okay, chapter 2, verse 91. And when they were told, believe in that God has sent down, they said, we believe in what was sent down on us. And they disbelieve in what is beyond that. Yet it is the truth confirming that what is with them. What's wrong with you Jews? This is what mom is saying. Why wouldn't you want to believe my Quran? I'm saying that my Quran says what you have is true. It's the word of God. And it bears witness to its veracity. All the more to accept my book. But see, yeah. the Jews realized how in the world could you claim that your book confirms what we have? Because what we have, as we see and we read, contradicts many of the things that your book says. So the Jews were being consistent in rejecting Muhammad because they could see his book did anything but confirm it. That didn't mean their book was corrupt. It meant Muhammad was a false prophet and the Quran is a book of lies. That was 291, but you wanted to say something before I was going to say uh, Al-Tawari agrees with you because, uh, and by the way, I'm reading from Arabic to English real quickly because it's not translated. Uh, he's saying also, uh, this is basically telling the Jews that what you have, notice, Torah and Injil, not just the Torah, Torah and Injil that you have in your hands, See? you need to basically believe in this book, the Quran, because it came to attest to the truth that you have with you right yeah. now. So, But how could that be if the Muslims are right, what they had at that time 
was corrupted so that it no longer accurately preserved or reflected what was originally sent down. That's right. A few more from two, and then we can go into other topics, maybe even some objections, or if you want to take questions, however the Spirit leads for the glory of Christ. 297. Say, whoever is an enemy to Gabriel, Jibril, alayhi salam. You have to say that, by the way. He it was that brought it down upon thy heart by the leave of God, confirming, confirming what was before it. Actually, it doesn't say that. It says, Musaddiqan lima baina yadehi. Confirming what is between his hands. But that's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll go with that translation. Notice 2101. This one I love. 2101. When there has come to them a messenger, chapter 2, verse 101. When there has come to them a messenger from God, confirming that which was with them. A party of them that were given the book reject the book of God behind their backs as though they knew not. So notice it's saying, this Quran was given to a messenger that confirms that which is with them. And 2.121, watch this. Those to whom we have given the book, and many commentators tell us it's referring to the Jews and Christians. 2.121. Right. Those to whom we've given the book and who recite it with true recitation. Now for the life of me, how can they recite the book with its true meaning and recitation if the book is corrupted and they no longer had the original revelation. And they're being praised, by the way. They believe in it. And whoso, whoso disbelieves in it, they shall be the losers. And the final one for this point, 447. You have been given the book. Believe in what we have sent down, confirming that which is with you before we obliterate faces and turn them upon their backs or curse them as we curse the Sabbath men and God's command is done. How many more verses must I quote to show the Quran is supposed to confirm, confirm, confirm what you have, what is with you, between your hands. Not something long ago that no longer exists. So, I mean, how many more verses do the Muslims need to hear and read before they're convinced the Quran says, my Bible in its present form, because that's the only scriptures these communities had, are the very incorruptible, preserved words of God. I don't know. In, in theory, it should only be one, right? Yeah, Allah's word exactly. is perfect. You, you should only created. need one verse confirming the, uh, the preservation of the Torah and the gospel, yeah. right? Yeah, it's sad, man. It's sad. It's truly sad. Next passage. Uh, there are going to be lots of other passages. I, I, it, it would be good, just for a yeah. moment, to, to address um, some of the Quranic passages which refer to no one being able to corrupt Allah's Beautiful. words. Yeah. Now, I, I understand that there are, uh, there are Muslims who would interpret this because the Quran does say, that, does say things along this, these lines that when it says no one can corrupt Allah's words, um, there are passages where this seems to indicate like you know, Allah's decree or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Like no, yeah, once yeah. Allah has made a decision or yeah, something like that. It's unalterable. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there are contexts in which the context is referring specifically to books, right? Precisely. Where it's referring specifically to books. Yes. And so let me go ahead and read uh, uh, two quick passages, um, chapter 18, verse 27. And recite what has been revealed to you of the book of your Lord. There is, there is none who can alter his words, and you shall not find any refuge besides him. So recite what has been revealed to you of the book of your Lord. There is none who can alter his words. So just, just if it's talking about in the context of a book, um, who is there who can alter Allah's words? Exactly. The, the Council of Nicaea? Yeah. The Apostle Paul, can the Apostle Paul do it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, if, if, if Allah says there's none who can alter his words, this, this is a claim about Allah's power, right? No one's powerful enough that's right. to change Allah's words. And that's why you can trust his words. No one can change them. Now, why is that disturbing? Well, according to pretty much every Muslim you'll ever run into, Allah's words were changed over and over and over and over and over until he got to the Quran and he tried and finally figured out how to preserve his words. Um, but why would you trust the Quran then if you're dealing with a God who, whose scriptures have been corrupted for centuries, right? Yes. And, and, and just couldn't protect them, even though he constantly brags about no one being able to change his words. Now, for you Muslims who are watching, you may be thinking, oh, but it's only talking about Allah being able to preserve his words in the Quran. Well, notice it doesn't say there is none who can alter his words in the Quran. Yeah. It says there's none who can alter his words. Yeah. Now, didn't we read in Surah 3, 3 through 4, that the Torah and the Gospel are Allah's words? Precisely. And when you're done quoting it, I'm going to quote a Muslim scholar who use 6.115 to prove the incorruptibility oh, let, 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 of the Torah. Let me, let me go ahead and read uh, yeah, 6.114 yeah. to 115. Shall I seek a judge other than Allah? And he it is who has revealed to you the book which is made plain. And those whom we have given the book, 
know that it is revealed by your Lord with truth. Therefore, you should not be of the disputers. And the word of your Lord has been accomplished truly and justly. There is none who can change his words, and he is the hearing, the knowing. So once again, there is none who can change his words. In context, it's, it's referring to the, the context is referring to a book. No one can change his words, referring to a book. Muslims will want to say, well, this, this only refers to the Quran. Well, the Quran claims to be clear. And it doesn't, if, if he wanted to be clear, he would say no one can change his words in the Quran, which I don't even know how that would work. Yeah, precisely. If he couldn't protect his other words, what, did he suddenly gain a new power? That would mean that he's, okay. not, he's not unchanging, yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, if he says that no one can change his words and it's in the context of a book and the Torah and the gospel are his words, you put those together and no one can change his words in any of his revelations, and right. are, are, we, are we just inventing this in as fact, we go along here? I'm going to quote, and our brother here will be familiar with, Ibn al-Qayyim, Ibn al-Jawziyya. Ibn al-Qayyim al yeah. The premier student of Ibn Taymiyyah. He had two renowned students. Ibn Kathir was the other. Now I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of his book. It's Al-Ighadat, Ighadat al-Lahfan. How do you pronounce that, dude? Volume 2, page 351. I'll, I'll break it down for you afterwards. Go All ahead. right, thank you, because I need help. I have a hard time with English. He gives three views. He's citing the three positions <clears throat> among Muslim scholars in regards to the preservation of the Torah. He mentions one group that says it's corrupted. Another group that says there's only minor changes, but the bulk of it has been preserved. Another group says all of it has been preserved. Now, I'm going to cite that part which scholars believe that all of the words of the original Torah, and by extension the other scriptures, have been preserved fully and perfectly by Allah. So this is what I'm going to be quoting. It's quite a lengthy, but notice the names he mentions. That holds the view, the previous scriptures have been preserved completely and perfectly. Nothing's missing. Notice the names he's going to mention. On the other side, another party of Hadith and Fiqh scholars said, these changes took place during its interpretation, not during the process of its revelation. In other words, it's not the text that's been corrupted. The corruption takes place in regards to the interpretation, misinterpreting it. This is the view of Abi Abdullah Muhammad bin Ishmael al-Bukhari, who said in his Hadith collection, no one can corrupt the text by removing any of Allah's words from his books, but they corrupted it by misinterpreting it. Surprise, surprise. Bukhari, the collector of the most authentic <clears throat> collection of narrations attributed to Muhammad and his companions, his position was that they corrupted the meaning, not the text, because he believed no one could corrupt any of the words, right. any of the texts of Allah. Imam al-Bukhari. But wait, it gets better. Al-Razi, another renowned Muslim commentator, also agrees with this opinion. And his commentary said, now again, well, let me read it. It's, it's relevant. There's a difference of opinions regarding this matter among some of the respectable scholars. Some of these scholars said the manuscript copies of the Torah were distrib distributed everywhere. Notice the logic. Sounds like us. And no one knows the exact number of these, ex uh, these copies except Allah. It is impossible to have a conspiracy to change or alter the Word of God in all of these copies without missing any copy. Such a conspiracy will not be logical or possible. Smart. Razi was genius. Yeah, he used logic here. And when Allah told His Messenger to ask the Jews to bring their Torah and read it concerning the stony command, they were not able to change this command from their copies. That is why they covered up the stony verse while they were reading it to the Prophet. It was then when Abdullah ibn Salam requested that they remove their hand so that the verse became clear. If they change or alter the Torah, then this verse would have been one of the most important verses to be altered by the Jews. And then final part. Also, whenever the Prophet asked them concerning the prophecies about him the Torah, they were not able to remove them either. And they would respond by stating that they are not about him and they are still waiting for the Prophet in the Torah. Now, what relevance does this have with 6.115? We're getting there. Mm -hmm. Notice another narration that Ibn Qayyim cites, the one we cite from Sunan Abu Dawood. Mm -hmm. Abu Dawood narrated in his collection that Ibn Umar, Ibn Umar said, a group of Jewish people invited the Messenger of Allah to a house. When he came, they asked him, O oh, Abu Qasim, one of our men committed adultery with a woman. What is your judgment against him? So they placed the pillow and asked the Messenger of Allah to sit on it. Then the Messenger of Allah proceeded to say, bring me the Torah. 
your copy. When they brought it, he removed the pillow from underneath him, placed the Torah on it, and said, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. Then said, Bring me one of you who have the most knowledge. So they brought him a young man who told him the story of the stoning. Now watch this comment. The scholar said, If the Torah was corrupted, he would not have placed it on the pillow, and he would not have said, I believe in you and the one who revealed you. This group of scholars also said, Bam, 6.115. Mm -hmm. Allah said, And the word of your Lord has been accomplished truly and justly. There is none who can change his words, and he is the hearing and the knowing, and the Torah is Allah's word. Yeah, and it's, it's uh, common sense. Why would he place it on a pillow? I mean, if it was a book that doesn't worth it. Why would he even ask for it mm -hmm. if it was a book that was corrupt? Yeah. I mean, Muhammad had his chance, really, to say, by the way, your book doesn't worth it. I mean, he disagreed with the Christians. He disagreed with the Jews, but he never attacked their scripture. Mm -hmm. He disagreed with them because they rejected him, yes. and he used their scripture as if it was the standard yeah. by which they violated mm -hmm. believing in him. Now, these are Muslim scholars know the Arabic, right? Mm -hmm. Why are they quoting 6.115 to prove the incorruptibility of the Torah if that verse clearly refers to the Quran alone? Mm -hmm. And uh, and and and. For those Muslims who would want to interpret it as only referring to uh, Allah preserving the Quran, think about this. If you've got major Muslim scholars claiming that this would also refer not just to the Quran, but also to the Torah, then at the very least the Quran is just unclear. Right? That would be the Precisely. minimum. In, in other words, if this were, if Allah really meant, oh, I can only preserve my words in the Quran, if that's what Allah really meant, <laughs> even some top Muslim scholars didn't get that memo. Precisely. They couldn't understand it. Yeah. And so they were led astray and led into falsehood uh, because Allah just wasn't clear on an issue that's very, very important, right? So uh, Christians and Muslims, there, there, there are lots of issues that it's, it's fine to be unclear right. on, right? We don't need to know every little detail about everything. Something about the, the preservation of the previous scriptures, that's kind of important to know. Yeah. And why, why is this important? Well, if you're talking about, uh, if you're talking about, you know, the, the disciples of Ibn Taymiyyah, yeah. you're talking 1300s, right? This is centuries. Yes. This yes. is centuries yeah, after the time 17, of Muhammad. Later, so yeah. by this time, by this time, people are well aware of the fact that the Quran contradicts the scriptures of Jews and Christians. They're well aware of that. The fact that there are still people saying, no, you can't corrupt, yep. you can't. That, in other words, I would expect all Muslims, even if the Quran were affirming the, the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the scripture, to be recognizing what Muslims today recognize, namely, these scriptures just don't line up. Yep. The fact yep. that they're still claiming that the Torah and the gospel can't be corrupted suggest that they were were just it's yeah. so clear it's so clear from the quran from that the we quran, can't yeah. get away from it we can't deny what the quran so clearly says and says. what i want to add is ibn qayyim al jawziyyah basically came even two centuries after ibn hazm yeah uh, supposedly the one you know the uh, came up with yeah. this claim about yes. the bible corruption so yeah. ibn qayyim obviously doesn't agree with ibn hazm based on the statements yeah. he made yeah, yeah, and precisely. he has his own commentary on the quran yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So that tells you that even these Muslims are reading these passages the way we do, and we're being honest with the text and is struggling with its implications. It's interesting you mentioned that the Quran is clear because the verse that you cited to prove that the words of Allah cannot be changed, 6.115, you read 6.114 with it. In the, that context, notice what, notice what 6.114 said, the verse immediately preceding that which said, none can change the words of, of thy Lord. 6.114, shall I seek other than Allah for judge? when he it is who hath fully revealed explained. unto you mm -hmm. this scripture fully explained. So verse 114 of chapter 6 tells you that this book is going to fully explain all its passages, what, it's mean, what it means. That's right. And so right after that 115 says, none can change the words of your Lord, but doesn't tell us it means only the Quran. Right? And how in the world would the Quran even fully explain something that is corrupt anyway? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, but you, you want one interest side note. I just want to bring a side note because I got some other passages. I'm going to you give you another angle. I mean, mm -hmm. You know about this thing. Unless you have more verses, we'll go through whatever. Interestingly, the Quran claims to be plain Arabic, clear, right? That's right. And it's a linguistic miracle, and, and no one can match it in its eloquence or its grammatical structure. Let me read that passage again. Shall I seek other than Allah for judge when he it is who hath revealed unto you this scripture fully explained? 
Those unto whom we gave the scripture, aforetime know that is revealed from thy Lord in truth. So be, be not thou, Muhammad, of the waivers. I don't know if you caught it. The one who's speaking is Allah. It is Allah who says, Shall I seek other than Allah for judge? When he it is with revealed unto you this scripture fully explained, how do I know it's Allah? Those unto whom we gave the scripture. The I becomes the we, and the I who becomes the we is the one who gave the scripture. How can it not be Allah? But Allah just started the sentence by saying, Shall I seek other than Allah for a judge? Which is why other translations deceitfully, yeah. mis misleadingly say, Say or say, O Muhammad. Yeah, wow. now, 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 that's beautiful. I have no objection. I would normally have no objections to inserting, you know, sure. something like say. But if you're constantly bragging about how perfect, if that's what Allah meant from all eternity, He could have included the word say and then the quotation, and this is the part you're supposed to say, and then it's Allah speaking again. Yes. When you for, when you leave out something like that, which ruins the uh, the context of the quotation, yeah. Yeah. constant constant problems with uh, with. And with the perfection of your speech. It's not one or two examples. No, that, that's throughout the entire it's Quran. It's throughout. There right. is a dozen passages or so where Allah speaks, and yet the way He speaks, He distinguishes Himself from someone else who is His Lord, who is His God, who commands Him, and whom He is subordinate to. So if you're going to go that route, you're going to have to say, well, the Quran is not the linguistic perfection or miracle that you make it out to be. Be good to do an entire series on that, right? We need to. Just situations where... Yeah, we need to. If Allah's word were really... Perfect, or even, Prove on, or yeah. even good. Yeah. Wouldn't yeah. it be good to, to to fix all these things, right? Wouldn't it, we would have done a better job or? of communicating the point than the author or authors of the Quran or editors. Absolutely. Exactly, we can yeah. do that. Yeah. No, I, I mean, Lord willing, we'll do that. Yeah, just, 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 just think. I mean, if if you were to do that in, I mean, they forgive a first grader or a second grader, but if you're if you're in middle school and you're making mistakes like that, like you're not clear who's speaking, yeah, and. At words have to be added to what you're writing to even make it clear who's speaking. Yeah. They would say you're not making it out of you're not making it out of middle school here until you until you get that right. And yet Allah, whose word is perfect from all eternity, who had all eternity to say exactly what He wanted, translators have to come in and say, okay, let me fix this so people know what the world it's talking yeah, about here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And because we're here, real quickly, two more examples because I would just to whet people's appetite. 1936. 1936 of the Quran, and lo, Allah is my Lord and your Lord, so serve him, that is a straight, right path. I challenge any Muslim to read the verses before and after. There is no one besides Allah who's speaking. Because the words of Jesus, supposedly, because Jesus is quoted, his words end in 1933, right? And then the narrator picks it up in 34, and that's supposed to be Allah. So Allah just said, and lo, Allah is my Lord and your Lord, so serve him, that is the right path. Mm -hmm. So Allah is telling you, look, I'm not the only Lord in town. Right, and there's someone else who's Allah, who's my Lord, so you got to serve mm -hmm. Him. And then the same chapter, 1964, which the other translations deceitfully, deceptively insert the word angels is not in the Arabic. Look, even there, even in uh, uh, 1936, the Halali Khan has, to add, has to add, yeah, Jesus. Oh, and Isa saying this, yeah, it's Isa saying and this. And you here. can see the in Arabic transliteration, it's Wa'inna, it's not Isa said no. Mm -hmm. Now, notice 1964, another interesting one. And we do not descend but by the command of your Lord, to Him belongs whatever is before us. Whatever is behind us, whatever is between these, and your Lord is not forgetful. The verses before and after have the speaker speaking in the plural, and it's clearly Allah. There is no change in the speaker, and yet here Allah, who's speaking in the plural, we, even the verses before, says, we, who's supposed to be Allah in the immediately preceding verses, we do not descend but by the command of your Lord. So who's commanding Allah to come down? Anyway, that's another topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. because in uh, verse 34, it starts by uh, making the announcement that that's Isa ibn Maryam. Yeah. So Allah is speaking now. Yeah, he's speaking about Isa. Yeah, exactly. But so that's, uh, we, we'll, get, we'll have fun uh, discussing the so-called linguistic the miracle of the Quran. Now, unless you have any other verses um, you want to look at, there's another angle in which you can uh, I just, I just wanted, uh, uh, even though it's, it's, it's kind of off topic since, yeah. since we brought it up, I just sure. wanted to quote Ali Dashti on this, yeah, right? Man. Uh, awesome, yeah. awesome quote by... Uh, uh, and the, tell him who he is, by the, the way. The so Iranian right. scholar uh, who, who wrote 23 Genius. years. Genius. Yeah. Genius. Uh, yes, brilliant. Um, Ali Dashti um, wanted to be honest about the Quran. Here's a quote by him from 23 years. He says, The Quran contains sentences which are incomplete and not fully intelligible without the aid of commentary. Is that true? You Absolutely. think that's true? Okay. Yeah. The Quran I can say it now <laughs> after I believed in Christ and my eyes opened up. Yep. Yeah. The Quran contains sentences which are incomplete and not fully intelligible without the aid of commentaries, foreign words, unfamiliar Arabic words, and words used with other than the normal meaning. 
adjectives and verbs inflected without observance of the concords of gender and number, illogically and ungrammatically applied pronouns which sometimes have no referent, and predicates which in rhymed passages are often remote from the subjects. These and other aberrations in the language have given scope to critics who deny the Quran's eloquence. So he's saying, uh, you know, Muslims constantly bragging about the perfect That's eloquence right. of the Quran. He's saying, look at look at all of this, right? These are all these are all problems here, and you have good reasons for denying the Quran's eloquence. And he wrote this as an atheist or as a Muslim Iranian Muslim scholar, right? Because I I actually thought when he wrote this he had lost his faith, mm -hmm. but nowhere in the book does he say he's not a Muslim. Hmm. Someone corrected me, actually. He said, no, no, no. Where'd you get he's not? A, he, he left Islam. Nowhere in the book does he say, I'm no longer a Muslim. So he's writing even from a perspective of yeah. an Iranian who still claims to be Muslim, but he's trying to be honest with the facts. That's right. And I mean, it would have served him better to say, I'm no longer a Muslim. At least people w will understand why he's saying yeah. this. But the fact that he didn't, that Yeah, means... because he was just struggling with the facts of the matter right. and he had to be honest. To, Which is to an facts. honest uh, struggle. I mean, uh, that's but, what... But uh, some claim it cost him his life because shortly after that he disappeared. So suspicion is he's probably murdered by the Ayat, Ayat Allah, the Ayatollah. But that's neither here nor that. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal book. We recommend everyone to get it. It's uh, It's... 23 years, right? 23 a prophetic years, career. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal book. Yep. One of the best books written on mm -hmm. the problems with the Quran and Islamic theology. Mm -hmm. Now, did you have verses do you want to quote? Or? I, I did want to go, uh, go and, and you, you can, of course, uh, expand upon things, but uh, Surah 5, verses 43 to 48. Yeah, and this uh, is a deep one, important. you know, and we have about, you know, 13 minutes. We're going to have to burn through these. All right, burn through do these. What you got to do. Um, uh, earlier, we mentioned the, the situation where um, the Jews came to Muhammad to settle a dispute. And uh, the cushion there, that, that was uh, some sort of uh, a judgment cushion. The judge would sit on this cushion indicating that, that he is the judge of this dispute. So it starts off with Muhammad sitting on this cushion as the judge, but he tells the Jews to bring the Torah. They bring the Torah out. He gets off the cushion and sets the Torah on the cushion and says, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. Now think about this. Who's the judge here? Muhammad's supposed to be the judge there, but then he gives it over to the Torah. So he's saying the Torah is the real judge, which makes no sense if the Torah has been corrupted. Precisely. No sense whatsoever. Judge that if, 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 the Torah, if the Torah had been corrupted, then you would need Muhammad to be the judge because the Torah is, is, is unreliable. But there's actually a Quran verse that's revealed in response to this situation. It's chapter 5, verse 43. So again, Jews come to Muhammad to settle a dispute. And here's Allah, we have Allah's response in chapter 5, verse 43 of the Quran. The entire passage all the way through uh, verse 48 is interesting. Uh, but chapter 5, verse 43, Allah responds, But why do they come to you, Muhammad, for decision when they have the Torah before them? Therein is the plain command of Allah. Yet even after that they would turn away, for they are not really people of faith. So notice, Muhammad, why are they coming to you for judgment when they've exactly. got the Torah? Exactly. If the Torah had been corrupted, Allah's response should have been, it's a good thing that they're recognizing that they need to come to you since their scriptures have been corrupted. Of course they need you. You're the only one who's got reliable revelation. Instead, what do they need you for, Muhammad? They don't need you. They don't need you. They've got the Torah. You get out of there. You get out. Get off the cushion, Muhammad. Right. Let, let, the, let the Torah judge them. Which is exactly what he did. And Al-Tawari was saying, you know, why are they even rejecting what God told them already about the punishment of the adulterer, mm -hmm. you know, in the book that they have with them. In mm -hmm. other words, like, they already know the judgment. Mm -hmm. Why are they coming to you? Precisely. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. does that sound like what Muslims uh, would tell us today? Would they say, hey, judge according to your Bible? They say, look, your Bible's corrupt, follow the Quran. Yeah, you don't need, you don't need Muhammad, you've got the Torah. Yeah, but that, that's not what Muslims tell us, right? No, your that's scriptures right. have been corrupted, you need Muhammad. So you're basically so, saying, The exact opposite of what Allah says. Yeah, Muslims say and believe on this issue, at least, they say and believe the exact opposite of what Allah says. And so, that is and So basically, that is Muslims sad. have abrogated their own Quran. Precisely. You have to. You have to. They know more than Muhammad. And, and their God. They obviously know more than Allah who revealed the Quran to Muhammad. But that's the, the glorious inconsistency of Muslims, spe right. specifically Muslim polemicists. But you want to continue. Yeah, let's go ahead and uh, let, let's go through this quickly because we only have a few minutes left. Um, so we'll stop whenever there's something, something important. So uh, we want to read the entire passage just so uh, yep. we're not messing anything up here. Um, so that was chapter 5, verse 43, verse 44. It was he who revealed the Torah. Therein was guidance and light. But by its standard have been judged the Jews by the prophets who bowed to God's will, by the rabbis and the doctors of the law, for to them was entrusted the protection of God's book, 
and they were witnesses thereto. Therefore fear not men, but fear me, and sell not my signs for a miserable price. If any fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, they are no better than the unbelievers. This is right after saying that the Jews have to judge by the Torah. Right? This is right after saying that the Jews have to judge by the Torah. If any fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, they are no better than those who rebel. And so if you refuse to judge by the Torah, you're a rebel against Allah. Right? That doesn't sound like Muslim, what Muslims would tell me today. They'll tell yeah. me if you follow the Bible, you're a rebel against Allah. Here we go. Chapter uh, 5, verse 45. Yeah. We ordained therein for them life for life, eye for eye, nose for nose, ear for ear, tooth for tooth, and wounds equal for equal. Yeah. Where, where is that? That's amazing. That's Exodus, Exodus 21, 21, 23. Yeah, 22 to 25. But it's still there. Yeah. Okay. It's still there. Same. That means that we're reading what so we, we have, have today. So we have a quotation. We have a quotation from the Torah. Reading what we have today. But if anyone remits the retaliation by way of charity, it is an act of atonement for himself. And if any fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, they are no better than the wrongdoers. Mm -hmm. So they quote the Torah and then say, if any fail to judge by the light yeah. of what Allah hath revealed, they're no and better the than... the warning is three times was repeated if yeah. they reject yes. the scripture. Mm -hmm. Yes, keep going. Yeah. And here we start turning to the gospel, chapter 5, verse 46, and in their footsteps we sent Jesus, the son of Mary, confirming the Torah that had come before him. Look at we the sent him, yeah, We sent him the gospel. Therein was guidance and light. And by the way, it's not was. Yeah, I know, it's is. I know, I know. Is, okay, yeah. <laughs> there is, and same, same thing with the Torah, right? Uh, therein <laughs> was, or is, guidance and light and confirmation of of the Torah that had come before him. Is that what it says? Nope. It says, again, Lima, it says, Musaddik and Lima Baini, Baini Yadehi, between his hands, uh -huh. what he had access Notice to. Notice the constant what he had. twisting of the scripture yes. in order to get the desired result. Why? Yeah. To deceive Muslims and non-Muslims who are reading the text into thinking that the Quran is not affirming their text right here. Both clauses here talk about yes, what is between his hands. Yeah, mm -hmm. because Baini Yadehi is between your hands. And that's an right. idiom meaning what he had access to. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like right now, you have it already, yeah, exactly. contemporary. So yeah. a guidance, uh, so a confirmation of the Torah between his, hands. between his hands, a guidance and an admonition to those who fear God. Chapter 5, verse 47, so the Jews were just told, you don't need Muhammad because you've got the Torah. Here we have chapter 5, verse 47, are Christians any different? Are Christians supposed to judge by the Quran? Are they supposed to listen to Muhammad? Chapter 5, verse 47, let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. If any do fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, they are no better than those who rebel. So wait. Let the people of the gospel judge by the Quran. Us, Is that what it said? No, it says the gospel. Judge by the, the gospel, what God has revealed in that gospel. gospel. Now, but just to be clear, how do we know that the people of Muhammad's time have the gospel of Jesus because in the context which gospel is referring to Jesus is right uh -huh. that's right so but wait is this referring to Muhammad's contemporaries mm -hmm. so you're telling me this verse presupposes that the gospel of Jesus was there in their position at the time Muhammad yeah there, 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 there are two alternatives here right yeah either Allah is telling them to judge by a book that they still have which would make sense right judge by the gospel and what would Christian how what would Christians think you mean if you tell them to judge by the gospel New Testament okay so Christians would, and, and at least the fourfold gospel, yeah, which yeah, from the yeah. second century on was called the gospel exactly, or the fourfold yeah. gospel. So at the very least, the four gospels, which were treated as a unit called the gospel, but uh, more likely a Christian would just say, you, you mean the New Testament. Uh, in other words, if Allah doesn't mean that, if he means some other book or something yeah, like exactly, that, he's yeah. not clear. It would be exactly, the least yeah. clear, the least right. clear communicator very in all of history. But not that he did anything like that about the cross, but yeah. anyway. Yeah. So let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. There, there are two interpretations. Either Allah means what, what it sounds like he means, we're yeah. supposed to judge by the gospel, or he means judge by a book that you don't have because it's been, it's been, uh, it was lost centuries ago and it's been corrupted. If that's what he means, he is the least clear communicator in history. Yeah. And guess what? There, there, there's a rule in, in uh, ethics that ought implies can. If I say you ought to do this or you have to do this, it means yeah, yeah. you at least have the opportunity to do it. If Allah is saying, you Christians judge by the gospel, and they don't have the gospel. How can they do it? That, 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 that would be absolutely ridiculous. So according to the Quran, the gospel has been around, the gospel has been around at least to the time of Muhammad. And guess what? We have copies of the gospel and before the time of it. Muhammad, during the time of Muhammad, and after the time of Muhammad. We know what the gospel during the time of Muhammad said. That's right. And it says what we have here today, ladies and gentlemen. It affirms the, the death sacrificial death of Jesus, his resurrection from the dead, and his divine nature. So if this is the book that we're supposed to judge by, then Muslims have a problem, right? Yeah, precisely. What would that problem be? And I will say, if, you know, you go to the Torah, 
and testifies about Jesus. You go to the New Testament. Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. Therefore, Muslims are in trouble either way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, you know, you since it's ironic, you just quoted the Gospel of John, right? I'm now going to prove from the oldest extent biography on the life of Muhammad that's still in our possession, albeit edited through Ibn Hisham, Sirat Rasulullah. Okay, let me, do, mm -hmm. let me quote it. And this is interesting because in, in the English translation of Sirat Rasulullah by, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, Alfred Guillaume, is mm -hmm. that how you pronounce Guillaume. it? I think yeah. Guillaume. He, yeah. And I recommend every serious student of Islam to get The Life of Muhammad by Alfred Guillaume. I'm not going to try to mm -hmm. translate. If you want to fall asleep, of course. Yeah, but no. you got to get yeah. it. That, that's that, right. It's a very important book. Online. Online. Yes. Yeah. Now here, because my time is up with mm -hmm. the computers, I got to read it. It's pages 103, 104 in his English translation. In this oldest extent biography, the Gospel of John. John chapter 15, John chapter 15, verse 23 to 16, verse 1 is cited. Here it is. The translation of Sirat Rasulullah, pages 103, 104. Let me read it. Among the things which have reached me about what Jesus, son of Mary, stated in the gospel, which he received from God for the Ahl al Injil, same expression right. in 547, for the followers of the gospel, and applying a term to describe the apostle of God, is the following. It is extracted from what John the apostle set down for them when he wrote the gospel for them from the testament of Jesus, son of Mary. Now, I don't re need to read it. He then quotes John 15, 23, 16 to 1. Notice what he says. This is the gospel God gave to Jesus, which John wrote down. So here we have the oldest biography on Muhammad's life, edited by John. Ibn Hisham, mm -hmm. who didn't omit this. We mm -hmm. know Ibn Hisham would omit yep. material. Things he didn't like, he exactly. left this intact. Exactly. Ibn Hisham left it intact, meaning that it met his approval. So here you have the oldest extent yeah. biography of Muhammad's life saying God, John's gospel is the gospel of God given to Jesus, preserved for the community and, of Jesus. And, and this shows what the early, how the early Muslim community was Thank interpreting uh, the commands to do the gospel. But, uh, so j just, to, just to sum up, since we're out of time, I'll sum up the, 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 the problem and, 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 yep. uh, and, and hand it back to Al here. But uh, uh, think about the problem here, right? We're told to judge by the gospel. If we judge by the gospel, what do we have to think about the Quran? It's wrong, right? Because it, it, contra it contradicts yeah. the gospel, which we're commanded to judge by, in which Allah says we're rebelling against God if we don't if we don't judge by this. Jews are supposed to judge by the Torah, according to the Quran. If right. Jews judge by the Torah, they have to regard Muhammad as a false <laughs> prophet, so they have to reject it. So there are two possibilities here. Either we have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, or we don't. If we have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, Islam is false because it contradicts what we have. If we don't have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, Islam is false because right. Islam affirms the inspiration, preservation, and authority of our scriptures. So if we have the word of God, Islam is false. If we don't have the word of God, Islam is false. Either way, Islam is false. Islam self-destructs. My Muslim friends, you need another new, you need a new religion. And I've got a suggestion for you. Amen. The Book of the Man. The Book of the, the Man the are the book in trouble, the man. both of them. And I have to tell my Muslim friends, if you truly, truly, be faithful just to the commentaries and your own book, you would leave both the book and the man and follow our man and our book. Hallelujah. That's basically Christ, what your book you. is telling you. Amen. If you're in doubt, and it sounds like to me you're doubting, ask the people of the book. Amen. And they will tell you the truth that is found in the book of God, the Bible. Have a blessed day.